Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Josh and you are watching Our History. Today we are going over the life of Hinsa Ka Kawuta. If you enjoy this, please be sure to like. And if you are new here, please consider smashing that subscribe button. If this isn't your first radio and you haven't shown some love to that subscribe button, now is your opportunity. Thank you very much. Hinsa Ka Kawuta Hinsa Ka Kawuta was a prominent figure in the Kosa kingdom who ruled for 15 years. He inherited a vast kingdom founded by his great ancestor, King Chawe that spanned from the Mbashe River to Khamtus River in the Southern Cape. Chief Hinsa was a powerful leader of the Amakosa Kingdom in Southern Africa. He was known for his diplomacy and strategic alliances, but also for his resistance against colonial expansion by the British Empire. This conflict was to last for over a hundred years as generations of Amakosa leaders fought to maintain their independence and sovereignty. The Kosa Kingdom is led by two houses, the Kaleka House the Great House or the Senior House, which is the Ruling House, and the Rarabe House, which is the Right Hand House, which is the Second Senior House. Tributary states during Hinsa's time were the Amatemba under King Nguben Kuka, Amapondo under King Faku, Amabovama clan under Chief Gambushe, Amabaka under King Madzikane, and Amapondimise under King Matiwane. Although closer by ethnicity, Amaponda and Matembu were autonomous tributary states to the Kosa kingdom. In his reign as king, he had 11 sub-chieftaincies and the Tembu, Mpondo and Batra kingdoms as tributaries. His early life, lineage and family. Hinsa was the son of Kauta Ka Kaleka. His father was the eldest son of Kaleka Kapalo. His mother, Nobuto, is said to be a daughter of Chachu, whose father was Toba and grandfather Tukwa of Tembulan. Hinsa is the ninth descendant of King Chawe and is also a direct descendant of King Tosa, the historical son of Nguni, who is known among the Ngunis as an aggressive, skilled warrior. Hinsa had four sons, Sarili Ka Hinsa, from his first wife, Nomsa Kagambushe Chesi, and Kapai Ka Hinsa, Mantriwa Ka Hinsa, and Lindi Nyura Ka Hinsa, from an unknown second wife, Rain. He was born in 1789 and became king in 1804 after his father's death. However, he only ascended to the throne officially in 1820 after taking over from his uncle Ngoko Kakaleka, who acted as a regent king. As a skilled warrior and diplomat, Hinsa established a reputation as a strong leader among the Kosa people. He is often compared to his great ancestor Chawe Ka Nkosiyamtu, army and military. The Tosa kingdom was among the most formidable kingdoms in Africa. During the reign of King Hinsa, the kingdom boasted of a strong army which was arguably the largest in southern Africa. King Hinsa had a regiment known as the Inkonyane, which was composed of several companies that moved diligently throughout the day. Although some historians dispute Hinsa's greatness as a Tosa king, it is evident that his chiefs controlled powerful armies that at times raided neighboring kingdoms or attacked Tosa rulers of tributary states. However, none of these powerful armies could match the paramount Hinsa's army in skill and prowess, invasions and civil war. The Tosa kingdom faced numerous challenges during its reign, including conflicts with the Cape Colony and civil wars between chiefs. Additionally, the nation had to fend off invasions by refugee tribes from the Mfekane. One such group was the Amabatra, led by Mazikane, who moved into Tembuland and attacked the right-hand house of Amachachu. This attack caused the Amachachu to seek refuge with Matoma. The Tosa, Tembu and Mpondomise kingdoms then joined forces to defeat the Batra, killing Madzikane in the process. The Batra later formed an uneasy alliance with the Mpondo and launched a joint attack on the Bomvana. However, this attack was repulsed by the Paramount Hinsa. Sixth Frontier War from 1834 to 1836 The Sixth Frontier War, also known as the Hinsa War, was a conflict that took place between the Klosa and the British from 1834 to 1836. The war erupted when a Cape Government Commando Party patrolled an area in the Kat River, which was under occupation of Rarabe chiefs Makoma, Tiali and Botumane. This action further fueled the bitterness of Makoma and Tiali, who had been evicted from the Tumer Valley 
in the previous year. In December 1834, a large force of about 10,000 Rarabe Kosas, led by Matkoma and Tiali, swept into the Cape Colony, causing extensive damage. Hinsa, although offering moral support, did not send an army to assist any of the chiefs. British troops led by Sir Harry Smith and Sir Benjamin de Urban were engaged in a fierce battle against the Kosa tribes. After several months of fighting, they realized that their campaign had gone on for too long and could make them unpopular with the authorities in Britain. To bolster their attack, they requested Hinsa to attack the Rarabe chiefs, offering 1,000 men. However, Hinsa was not willing to betray the Rarabe chiefs. De Urban used this as a pretext to declare war on Hinsa. Nonetheless, Hinsa chose to negotiate with the British instead of resorting to violence. On the 14th of April 1835, British Governor Sir Benjamin de Urban confronted King Hinsa of the Tlosa nation with a large army. The governor accused Hinsa of being responsible for the initial attacks on the Cape Colony and reclaiming the cattle that was previously stolen from the Tlosa people. De Urban declared that Hinsa was the leader of the entire Tlosa nation and dictated the terms of their agreement. The governor stated that the area between the Cape's prior frontier, the Kiskama River and the Great Kay River, would be annexed as the British Queen Adelaide province. The inhabitants of this region would be declared British subjects and all cattle initially claimed from the Kosa people were to be returned to the Cape Colony. An account of his death. In 1835, the governor of the Cape, Sir Harry Smith, invited Hinsa, the Tlosa leader, to peace talks. However, the British had demanded 50,000 cattle as compensation for the war that had taken place in 1834. Additionally, they demanded that Hinsa order his chiefs to surrender. When Hinsa refused to comply with these terms, he was held captive until the demands were met. In response, Hinsa sent a message to Matkoma, his military commander, to prepare to defend the country against the British. In May 1835, Hinsa was riding as prisoner guarded by a company of British soldiers led by Harry Smith. Mostert tells this story. The march was resumed at midnight on the 11th, breakfasting at daylight on the 12th of May, with more signal flares in the distance. Hinsa suddenly demanded, What have the cattle done that you want them? Why must I see my subjects deprived of them? That you know far better than I do, Smith angrily replied. Throughout this expedition, Hinsa had been guarded by members of the Corps of Guides under a lithe, tough young settler, George Southey, who became suspicious when, at the bottom of a steep hill that rose abruptly from the river, Hinsa dismounted and walked his horse. Southey told another guide, Caesar Andrews, to draw his gun because Hinsa was saving the horse's strength and obviously planned to escape. Halfway up the hill, Hinsa decided to ride again instead of walk. All along, he had been free to move within the column as he chose, accompanied by the guides. Once on his horse, he spurred ahead until he came along. Harry Smith. Someone shouted, Hinsa's off. Smith drew his own pistol and shouted, Hinsa stop. The chief had ridden into a thicket. As he emerged back into the path, smiled at Smith, who immediately regretted his suspicions. He allowed Hinsa to continue past him, to where the guides now were riding at the head of the march. When he reached the top of the hill, Smith turned to look back at the column. There was another shout, Hinsa is off. The chief had suddenly urged his horse past the guides and was galloping across open country toward a village near a river. Harry Smith, with a sort of immediate passion rush of energy that he seemed always able to summon at such moments himself led the chase. For half a mile, Hinsa's horse was as fast as Smith's, but he was gradually overtaken. Smith pulled out a pistol, but it snapped. He took out another, but it also snapped. He eased his horse to allow it to recover wind and then spurred it once more until he came alongside Hinsa. He stabbed furiously with his assegai. Smith drew his useless pistols at the chief and then, coming so close that Hinsa had difficulty stabbing, he threw the chief violently from his horse. Oh, if I could but describe the countenance of Hinsa when I seized him by the throat and he was in the act of falling. Smith later wrote to his wife, a devil could not have breathed more liquid flame. I shall never forget it. Smith's own horse was racing too wildly to round easily, but George Southey and the other guides had caught up. Shoot, George, and be damned to you, Smith shouted back. Southey fired and hit Hinsa in the left leg. The chief stumbled, but got to his feet again. Smith, galloping back, yelled, be damned to you, shoot again. Southey fired, and Hinsa pitched forward, but once again, he struggled to his feet and managed to reach thick cover along the bank of the river. Southey and Smith's aide-de-camp, Lieutenant Paddy Balfour, went down to the river, followed by others. Southey was clambering over a rock when an Asagai struck the surface close by. Turning, he saw Hinsa in the water, submerged except for his head. A Khoi Khoi trooper wading through the river had also spotted the chief, who then stood up and called out several times in Kosa, Mercy, George Southey who spoke closer fluently, took aim and fired, shattering Hinsa's head and scattering his brains 
and skull fragments over the bank. Saudi was first beside the body and quickly took Hintz's brass ornaments for himself. As others gathered around, they grabbed for what was left of Hintz's beads and bracelets. George Saudi or his brother William cut off one of Hintz's ears and someone else took the other ear. Assistant Surgeon Ford of the 72nd Highlanders was seen trying to extract some of the chief's teeth. This was a very strong and barbarous thing to do, but we did not think it so at the time. Henry James Hulse, one of the settler provisionals, later wrote, Another provisional, Captain William Gilfillan, did not wait for a far future to regard it as bestial. That night, he expressed in his diary his regret that some had allowed their insatiable thirst of possessing a relic of so great a man to get the better of their humanity and better feeling who teaches us not to trample on a fallen foe. Smith ordered the body to be brought up the hill from the river. An officer told some of the soldiers to wrap Hintz's body in a cross and bring it up to a horse. On the way up, however, a second message arrived from Smith to say he no longer wished to see the body. It was dropped from the horse and left lying on the ground for his followers to find. I had no tools or I would have buried it, Smith later said. A statement hard to believe, especially from such a resourceful man whose army experience taught him the uses of a band and whose own store wagons were hardly likely to have been on the road without a spade or two. Thus terminated the career of Chief Henser, he wrote in his official report of the event, whose treachery, perfidy and want of faith made him unworthy of the nation of atrocious and indomitable savages over whom he was acknowledged chieftain. Some of Henser's bracelets and assegai he had thrown at Smith were sent home to Juana, his own souvenirs of the man of whom he held so many conflicting views. Validity of the account the account of Hintz's death, as recorded by the British colonial officials, has been called into question by some commentators. There are concerns that the officials may have recorded false accounts, and therefore the validity of the story cannot be fully trusted. It is believed that the officials would have wanted to diminish Hintz's status in history, who was a bold military leader, and therefore they may have added details such as the king's trying to flee, throwing his spear harmlessly, and even trying to cry mercy. These details are not believed to be accurate, and may have been added to cast negative light on Hintza's legacy. His legacy. Hintza was a prominent leader of the Xhosa Kingdom of the history of South Africa. He led multiple wars against the British colonialists and caused a downfall of the Xhosa Kingdom, which had a significant impact on the formation of the South African as a country. His legacy passed down through the oral history with poems and stories recounting his bravery and leadership abilities. In 1996, a supposed descendant of Hintza, Nicholas Tilana Kaleka, claimed to have discovered his skull in Scotland. However, forensic tests later revealed that the skull was likely to be that of a middle-aged European woman, debunking the claims of its authenticity. The King Hintza Bravery Award is established in 1999 to recognize leaders who embody the spirit of Hintza Kakauta. The award has been given to several leaders, including Robert Mugabe and Jacob Zuma. It is awarded by the ruling Kosa King. In 2014, several technical colleges merged to form the King Hintza Tvet College in honor of King Hintza. The college is headquartered in Butterworth, Eastern Cape, and hosts the annual King Hintza Memorial Lecture every May since 2013. The college aims to continue the legacy of King Hintza by providing quality education and preparing future leaders for their roles in society.